the 20th Sunday after Trinity, the Collect. Almighty and most merciful God of thy bountiful goodness, keep this nation, we pray, from the things that are injuring it, from its sins. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And help us as your people to bear witness to your canon and to offer up ourselves body and soul that we may speak anew to those outside our world, outside the churches. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're praying for the nation today. We're trying to set up a system where each day there's a focus. And today is on the nation. Dare we forget? Ascension Day 222, 220. O risen Christ, ascended Lord, all praise to thee, let earth accord who are while endless ages run with Father and the Spirit, one. Well, we turn our attention to a perennial question that uh, entered in the Old Testament guild. We're dealing with that in some of the other series on Pentateuchal authorship and go around and around and around. And uh, I think probably Robert Dick Wilson of old Princeton is, and William Henry Green are the decisive body blows to that. But it gets no press in the imperialist world of the Old Testament guild where the patronage system seems to be in place, where the churches follow the, the imperialists at the top. And they have to be called that because they embraced hook, line, and sinker, Hegelian evolutionism, and they undercut the Old Testament can and cut themselves off from the vitality of the witness of the Old Testament. But anyways, the work before us is called, Was Moses the author of the Pentateuch? Answered in the affirmative, Pentateuch being Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. By the Dr. Herman Witsius, or Witsius, uh, translated by Reverend John Dal Donaldson of the Free Church. Done in Edinburgh, published in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, London in 1877. Meanwhile, the English crisis is going on with the Tractarians south of the border. Uh, Bishop Colenso has created a bit of a disaster um, in India, I think it was India, or Natal. At all, and they, they excommunicated him because he recklessly, he was pretty reckless, not a very good scholar, is my understanding. Just recklessly fell like and then blew over. You know. uh, we got a statement here by Principal Cunningham uh, in his prefatory note to the translation Witsius de Vero Theologo. Witsius needs, here's a quote, Witsius needs no recommendation from anyone. He's long been regarded by all competent judges as presenting a very fine and remarkable combination of the highest qualities that go to constitute the true and consummate theologian. Talent, sound judgment, learning, orthodoxy, piety, unction. That's worth copying. We're going to add that to our uh, aspirational list. Contents. Uh, and this is a short little volume here. It's 70 pages. That the Pentateuch was written by Moses, the belief of all antiquity. And mind you, he's born in 1636 and dies, what, 1708-ish? This is a 17th century Dutch theologian. There were some, some doubts in the middle, medieval period, my, is my understanding, among a few and some as to this question by the rabbis. So, And he's knee-deep in Hebrew, Arabic, and Syriac studies. He's an Old Testament man. Number two, this is now loudly contradicted by certain philosophers and critics. Whoa. 
three by Hobbes, four by anonymous maintainer of the existence of a pre-Adamitic race of the state, by Spinoza, six by Simon, seven by Leclerc, who would rather ascribe to the authorship of the Pentateuch to some Samaritan priest. Eight, yet beyond doubt, Mo Moses was an illustrious writer. Nine, and wrote laws given to him by God. Ten, not those only which constitute the rule of uprightness and of divine government and are extant in the book of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> now, let's just pause for a moment. It's only been the last hundred years, 120 years that the Americans fell for Spinoza and the others. This has long been debated and precedes the American scene, which is kind of new in church history. If we date it, say, from 1789, 220 years, you know, 10% of church history. If we say church history from the apostolic period, it's even more. We go back to Abraham. and I mean, it's, a, it's not like that. Yet these guys talk like imperialists and pontificators. Oh, we're sure of this, sure of that. We're in the scientific era. Nine, uh, number 12, nay, prophecies too. And then it skips several chapters and goes down to what we got here. 18, Moses also wrote histories. 19, Christ himself calls these books Moses. 20, he declares Exodus to be the book of Moses. 21, James and Paul put their seal upon the whole Pentateuch as his work by terming it Moses. The same old, this is the classical argument. 22, a recapitulation of the propositions already proved. 23, an exception of Leclerc's. 24, proved to be profane. 25, Simon's opinion refuted. Another chapter, 27, Spinoza's also 28. 29, and Leclerc's 30, an address to all these parties. <laughs> We're on page 10 of 70. He's got a lot of work to do. 31 is not to be denied that a very few passages are extant in the Pentateuch by a writer of later date than the time of Moses. That's admitted by all hands. Uh, 23 is sort of an obituary notice. 32, Leclerc has collected many such passages. on his own authority. 33, Genesis 2, 11. Um, he goes through a bunch of Bible verses. Genesis 8, 10, 8, 11, 11, 18 to 31, 12 to 6, 14, 14, 25, 21, 26, 31, 27, 14, 40, verse 15. That was Genesis. Exodus 6, 26. Uh, 43, the word Nabi and prophet known before the time of Moses. Exodus 36 examined, Exodus 35 examined, Deuteronomy 1.1, 1, 1, Deuteronomy 3.14, and then the conclusion. Well, let's get going here. Introductory note. Some friends to whom it was known that I had been engaged many years ago under the auspices and encouragement of Principal Cunningham and Dr. John Duncan in translating for publication select portions of the writings of Vitzius requested me lately to translate and publish his dissertation on mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. It also expected of me that I should write a preface, introducing it to notice, connecting it with the present reopening of the question by the publication of the article Bible in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Being at the time of the application, though disabled by chronic disease, somewhat better than usual, I readily undertook the task. But it proved one greatly too hard for me. An increase of illness supervened, and with the exception of two or three pages, the whole of this little work has been written on a sickbed or dictated from it. I do not mention these circumstances to deprecate criticism but merely to explain that translation and still more the preface 
or in point of execution very far from satisfying myself. My plan was repeatedly altered from the issue of the report of the committee appointed to deal with the author of the article Bible and from the publication of an excellent pamphlet by the Reverend James Kennedy, B.D., superseding not a little of what I had previously written. <clears throat> from these circumstances, large excisions have been made and the reunion of severed portions has not been altogether so successful as to give the whole composition that unity of structure, which, if I deceived not myself, it would have otherwise exhibited. Sequestered in obscurity for more than 18 years, I would have kept silence, but for the requests alluded to and the wish to contribute, though but a little, to the judgment adjustment of the awful issues confronting the superior courts of our church. And I must add, to exonerate my own conscience as a member and minister of the free church from any participation in the sinful procedure, which under an alarming pressure she is in danger of adopting. Curry, 1877. A little bit of a nosebleed there, maybe. Excuse me. Well, here we begin. This is the property of Princeton Theological Seminary. It was received in 1881. It probably was known to Professor William Henry Green. The latter part of the 17th century witnessed a series of attacks by men of learning, both at home and abroad upon the authorship and inspiration of the Pentateuch and consequently upon its canonicity. This is the preface. Who is writing this? Various other questions it is easy to see would arise in connection with the general issue. Among the motley bland, band of assailants, two English writers reached an evil preeminence. They were Sir John Marsham and Dr. John Spencer. In 1672, John Marsham published his Canon Chronicus, Egypticiacus, Ebriacus, Graecus et Disputation Honest. The work, is, I'm not sure if this is an editor or it's Vitzius, but his method, which was excellent, we cannot here epitomize. But unfortunately, he entered into speculations as to the antiquity and origin of some Jewish rites. In this work, displaying much learning and deep research into obscure recesses of antiquity, the writer made an attack upon the truth and authority of the Pentateuch. His position in regard to the rites and ceremonial matters of the Hebrews was substantially this that those which existed both before and after the time of Moses were derived from the Egyptians, that they preceded other nations and other religious matters, and that their rites were transferred by the Hebrews for their own observance, not perchance without some degree of purification. These views were evidently entirely incompatible with any conviction of the divine origin and authority of the Jewish system of ritual and worship. <clears throat> In 1669, John Spencer, D.D., while rector of Land Beach, Cambridgeshire, published a Latin dissertation, De Urum et Thummim. In 1685, by that time, Dean of Eli, he published his largest work, De Legibus Hebraeorum Ritualibus et Iarum Rationibus. Insofar as the works now named of these two writers touched upon the origin of Jewish ritual, they had a good deal in common. Spencer going further than Marsham in his irreverent assumptions and even receiving the chastisement on that account from the less unscrupulous layman. Spencer maintained that the whole Jewish worship and ritual was a copy, more or less modified, 
of the religion and religious rites in use in Egypt. And that in some instances, the, they were introduced into the Jewish ritual, the use of certain and special symbols to supersede some of a nature too hideous to be mentioned. Witsi has published an answer. Okay, so this is somebody who's writing an introduction. Both Marsha and Spencer in one work entitled Egyptica. In this comprehensive treatise, he admits of resemblances between some Egyptian and some Jewish rites, vindicates the substantial independence and originality of the Jewish system, and puts the whole on a proper basis as established and upheld by the most solemn divine sanctions and public manifestations of God's near presence vouchsafed under the whole e Testament economy. Spencer's work continued to call forth various replies, both abroad and in England, to a comparatively recent date, one by the late Reverend William Jones, held in considerable repute in 1799. Well, this is not by Vitius, so, because he died, what, 1708? We, but we have to do with Witsius, a second edition of his work regarded by bibliographers as the best, appeared in 1696. Such was his earliest and most elaborate contribution to what would now be called apologetics of the Pentateuch, or a portion of its contents. He resumed the defense of the Pentateuch in the following dissertation on its mosaic authorship, forming the 14th chapter of his work on prophets and prophecy. I don't know if I have that. Uh, we'll check the check. I mean, he's just a genius. Now, is it in his covenants? I don't know. Which, again, which, again, occupies the first 400 pages of him, or so of his miscellanea. The chapter referred to was called forth by the attacks of a number of writers upon the inspiration and authority of the Pentateuch, but who did not, like Marsham and Spencer, embody their sentiments in lengthy separate publications. Witsius' work on prophecy is learned and full in the best sense and is to a most unusual degree at once elaborate and readable, traversing chronologically the whole heaven-lit track of prophecy from Adam to St. John the Divine. Its plan is both natural and exhaustive and admits easily of an occasional excursus at once so fresh and pleasing that both the author, author and reader proceed, proceed in the happiest accord. Instead of having the flesh wearied, they have the spirit refreshed and are even better pleased with each other when the bypath rejoins than when it left the highway. The largest and perhaps the most important of these digressions is that here translated and presented to the reader's notice, Witsius selected a group of antagonists, all of considerable powers, extensive learning, too miscellaneous, perhaps, and applied too often to subjects of little or merely temporary importance, and in nothing so united as an avowed antipathy to the word of God as a record divinely inspired and by the exercise of divine providence of ineffable power and majesty, kept all along to this day substantially pure and incorrupt while hostile empires and dynasties rose, fell, and were swept away as the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The value of the dissertation is sufficiently attested by the effect its publication had on a cleric, against whose views the larger and most important portion is directed. Statements calling in question the authorship of the Pentateuch necessarily involved the fundamental doctrine of the plenary inspiration of sacred scriptures. The orthodox doctrine of inspiration was never more clearly or succinctly defined than by Principal Cunningham, 
when he declared during the great and most important <coughs> apocrypha controversy that inspiration must be plenary to be inspiration and that if it is plenary, it must be verbal. In the fullest harmony with this aphorism were the well-matured, self-coherent views of Dr. Chalmers on the same subject. Under him, an ever-decreasing minority of older ministers had the privilege, alas, too often inadequately valued at the time to be reared. For all the irrelevant and irreverent as, as irre irrelevant, Discussions by many writers as to the modes of inspiration, if by suggestion or impulse or by elevation. We see that a lot. We saw that in old Dr. Walter Brueggemann. Oh, these ecstatic moments. But they didn't write, he tells us, old Wally tells us. He had no patience. This is speaking of Dr. Cunningham now. To his so lofty and thoroughly Baconian mind, they were utterly loathsome. To such a priori and unwarranted theorizing, he would neither look nor listen. Ours, he would say, neither the right nor power to penetrate that re region of the unrevealed, therefore unknowable. Aware as a ma such a master of mental science could not fail to be, of the importance of lodging in young minds, brief formula of the principles of great questions, he would proceed thus. After a bout of animated discussion from his notes on the question for the day, suddenly catching fire by collision with some hateful and ruinous error or the brisk flippancy of some opponent, he would start to his feet, throwing his spectacles up on his forehead and at the pitch of his voice, with his resistless torrent of force, hurl forth such formula, such forms of principles as these. We have nothing to do as regards inspiration with the modus operandi, method of procedure in the process, but exclusively with the opus operatum result produced. Either a word was permitted because it was the best, or it was suggested and therefore was the best. And again, either way, the optimism of scripture was secured. Or again, sufficient be it for us to know that so it is, without inquiring how it is. The last brief summary of the mingled meekness and fear becoming the student of scripture was a frequent one. And so another, we ought, he would say, to aim to wise up to what is written without seeking to wise above what is written. Bacon's aphorism, homo non es magister, sed interpris naturae, naturae, naturae. <laughs> Man is not the master, but the interpreter of nature. Homo non es magister, sed interpris scripturae. Man is not the master, but the interpreter of scripture. And now we're up to page 17. When are we going to get the uh, Vitzius here? Calming down, handling his spectacles, while his features, so various in expression, would subside into that semblance they sometimes had to calm, penetrating look of another man. In broad and shrewd common sense, so like and most other qualities so totally different, Benjamin Franklin, he would with quiet, decisive firmness, by remarking in tones and pronunciation memorable to some, till their hearts beat no more. I have great valley for that distinction, gentlemen. Alongside Dr. Chalmers' peculiarities of thought, enveloping the diction and vehement delivery and action, which so arrested the attention of all ages, classes, and ranks. The style of Vitzius is apt to appear too tame, calm, and softly eloquent. <clears throat> the great Dutch divine handled some points connected with the inspiration which Chalmers would not have taken up, at least did not, but not at all in that a priori method which was so peculiarly offensive 
to this humble and rigidly Baconian mind. But in substance, Chalmers and he, as writers, are in fullest concord, separate in instruments of different classes even, but attuned in sweetest union by one spirit who worketh all in all. It were foolish to attempt to conceal that this little work is published as a counteractive to views recently put forth in an influential work and by a young man universally admitted to be profoundly and exceptionally versed in the sacred scriptures and in particular familiar with Hebrew and its varied allied tongues. But here commendation must end. The article alluded to, while professing to be intended to meet and neutralize the conclusions of the so-called destructive school of criticism, is itself to a very great degree deserving of the same condemnation. It contains a multitude of profane and audacious assumptions, impugning the genuineness and the canonicity of several books of scripture and numerous portions other, and thus of necessity denying, not indeed in explicit terms, but practically, the inspiration of the binding authority over the conscience of the books. The Pentateuch, and here I think we're gonna to have to draw it to an end due to time. And we're up to page 18 of 70, and everybody's doing the talking. We like it, enjoying it, but. Let's, I'd like to hear a witsius, and I'm not sure who's writing this, but it's Ascension Day 221, O Lord Most High, Eternal King, by thee redeemed thy praise we sing. The bonds of death are burst by thee, and grace has won the victory. Hallelujah. As we remember our nation tonight, let us pray. O Lord of glory. May there be a mighty change wrought by your own omnipotent hand. Without it, we realize we're under judgment. Either way, blessed or judged, may all of the honor and the glory be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Godspeed.